grace and peace be with all of you. On this Sunday, in the midst of a pandemic, a struggling economy, turmoil in the Capitol and in the White House, and our own personal and private sufferings, why are we talking about baptism here in church? Why is that relevant? What does that have to do with anything? Well, baptism is about identity. It's about the core of who we are, who we claim to be, who we believe the people around us are. And therefore, baptism, because it is about our very core identity, it is about the way we choose to live. This morning's text is about the identity of Jesus. Jesus is baptized by John the baptizer, and there is a voice from heaven declaring his identity. You are my son, the beloved, in you I am well pleased. Our baptisms also are about who we are, who we claim to be. Many of the things that we are arguing about outside of these church walls right now in our everyday lives are in fact questions about identity, racial identity, class identity, uh, political identity. They are all questions about the categories that we put ourselves in one another in. And then once we've decided what those categories are, either for ourselves or for the person next to us, then we put either a plus sign or a minus sign next to that category, typically. And we know this identity over here somehow makes that person more worthy than that identity over there, which makes that person less worthy. Now, Human beings have been doing this, as far as I know, since the beginning of time. Jesus spends quite a bit of time talking about the ways this was done in his own culture, in his own society. And we have our own categories now. The ones that are particularly electric for us right now are around race, and they are around political allegiance. And what happens with human beings very often, we see this over and over again throughout history, is we create these categories of identity and we give them pluses and minuses. And then we subject one another to either punishment, or we raise people up in adulation and give them special privileges. And we all know this is true, and in fact, children who are wonderful hypocrisy detectors, they learn these lessons from a very young age. You can walk into any middle school lunchroom, and in that particular middle school, in that lunchroom, every kid can tell you who the cool kids are, what the right kind of clothes are to wear, and who the rejects are, and what the good categories and the bad categories of the people around them are, and they could probably even divvy up their classmates. But we start doing this at quite a young age. It is the way humans negotiate their social lives. And I say they, I include myself in this. This is the way we operate as human beings. If you're a fan of Dr. Seuss, you can find a humorous story about this human propensity in his story about the Sneetches. You may remember there are star belly Sneetches and there are plain belly Sneetches. 
And Dr. Seuss has a lovely, disarming way of talking about exactly this human phenomenon that we all know and live in day in and day out. So our Christian identity, this identity that we take on when we are baptized, you may remember when you have watched other people being baptized, if you don't remember your own baptism, the priest anoints the person who is baptized and says, you are marked as Christ's own forever. Being baptized is a claim to a certain identity. It is a claim that you belong to Christ. So is this Christian identity just one more identity that may be relevant today and is not so relevant tomorrow? Just another one of those categories that we put a plus or a minus on. It's worth thinking about. I think there have been times historically when, at least in the early years of the church, it was definitely a negative category to be a Christian. You might get thrown to the lions, you might be martyred. And then after Constantine decided, oh no, I'm gonna put a plus sign next to that Christian identity, then things got good for Christians. And we started putting negative signs next to people who weren't Christians. And now we're entering a new time where it's not always to our advantage to be a Christian in some environments. Things seem to be shifting. So this baptism into the Christian identity, I want to think about whether or not that's just like all the other identities that we claim and give a value to, or if it's something different. It starts with Baptism, we see that in our reading today. It starts with a baptism of repentance. And what does that mean? It means that to take on the Christian identity, the very first act, the way one enters in, is through an act of humility and truthfulness about who one is. In order to repent, you have to have a very real sense of who you are. You have to be truthful and genuine and vulnerable. And if you think about the act of baptism, in the early days of baptism, people would disrobe. They would take off all their clothes, and there they were naked. And then they would get that baptismal robe and take on a new identity that was different than all the different identities that the world had given them. If we think about the way Jesus talks about what it means to be his follower, the easiest thing that we can turn to might be the greatest commandment. To love God with all your heart and soul and mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. So right there, in that description of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to love your neighbor as yourself, it matters. It matters how you love yourself, how you understand yourself, how you see yourself. And then in turn, it matters how you see your neighbor, how you love your neighbor, how you understand your neighbor. That basically this question of identity who I am, who my neighbor is, this is the core of what it means to be a Christian. This is the question that Jesus came to address. You might remember in Galatians, Galatians 3.8, in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile. In Christ there is no slave or free. In Christ there is no male or female. Those were the categories of the ancient world. Some of them are still relevant for us today. But we, if we were writing Galatians today, if we are writing this letter, we might add some other categories. And I'm sure you can add more on to what I add on this morning. In Christ there is no black or white. 
In Christ, there is no Republican or Democrat. In Christ, there is no urban sophisticated city dweller and monster truck driving rural uneducated person. There is something about belonging to the body of Christ that is deeper and more fundamental and more important and more true about being human than any of these labels that we put on ourselves and one another. If we were to retell the parable of the Good Samaritan, and you will remember from Scripture, why does Jesus tell this parable? Someone asks him about the greatest commandment, and then they follow up that question because they want to look smart, and they say to Jesus, okay, love God, love your neighbor. Who's my neighbor then? And Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, I don't know any Samaritans. It's just an idea from the Bible to me. So I get the gist of that parable, but it doesn't have the effect on me that it had on Jesus' listeners. The Jews despised the Samaritans. They looked down on the Samaritans. They did not think the Samaritans were members of the covenant. They were less than Jewish. They cursed them regularly in the synagogue. Samaritans were not allowed to be witnesses in court. So let's tell that parable of the Good Samaritan with some categories that might resonate with us emotionally. And you can do this yourself at home. It, it's oh, endless creative possibilities here. Let's say that there is someone lying in a ditch, a homeless person moaning, perhaps on a city street, we'll bring it into our times. Let's say that you are a, just to start with someone, let's say that you're a left-leaning political person, more on the democratic progressive side, and if Jesus told this story to you, he might tell it this way. There's a homeless person moaning on the street, and Michelle and Barack Obama come by, and their limousine just drives right by. And then Nancy Pelosi comes by talking to some reporters, and she just walks right by. And then I don't know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez comes by, and she's on her phone, posting on Instagram, and she walks right on by. And then a Trump supporter shows up. Maybe even a Trump supporter with some offensive bumper sticker on their monster truck. And they see that man lying in the ditch, and they stop, and they take care of him, and they take him to a clinic, and they pay the bill. Now, if you're on that left side of the aisle, that story is going to offend and upset you. And if we flip it around and we tell it exactly the opposite, and we tell it that that person, that homeless person is lying in the street and Donald Trump and his entourage come by in their limousines and they don't even see him lying there. And then Mitch McConnell comes and he's busy talking to reporters and he also walks on by. And then maybe there's some Fox pundit Sean Hannity, and he's on his phone and talking to his cameraman, and he walks on by. And then some young, pink-haired, 
hippie looking kid comes along and they pay attention and they see that person and they tend to them and they take them to the clinic and they make sure that they're cared for. That's the kind of story that Jesus was telling to the people of his day. We don't hear it because we're not Jews and Samaritans. But if we put in our own categories, we can get the message that Jesus was sending. He was an equal opportunity challenger to these judgments that we place on one another. I can tell you that we are living now in a culture of contempt. And we are spending tremendous amounts of time in person, on the phone, on social media, on our computers, deciding who is worthy and who is not, demeaning people, insulting people, canceling people. This is the world we are living in. It's always the world we live in, but it's been turned up exponentially. It is not safe or easy to live otherwise right now. If we choose to be followers of Jesus and to listen to the promises that we made in our baptismal covenant, and I'm going to open up my prayer book and I'll remind us all what those are. These are the last two in the series. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? And we have all answered many times, I will with God's help. And the final one, will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will with God's help. To do that in this environment that we are living in is hard. There is a social cost when you do not choose to play along and join in. There is not just a social cost, there is an emotional cost if we are honest with ourselves. We lose that feeling of satisfaction that the human heart gets when we feel that we are somehow more rational, more sophisticated, more important, in some way superior to that person over there. There are costs to claiming the Christian identity. There have always been costs. I suspect there always will be but there are certainly costs now. This is the time, my friends, to think deeply about who we are, whether or not we will claim this Christian identity, whether or not 